What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, share the video, and make sure you leave a comment. Probably going to enjoy this one a little bit, I think. I got a guy on that actually lives in my neighborhood. Crazy, right? Um, Guy from my city, from my neighborhood. We uh, met kind of crazy way that we had met or whatever. <laughs> we'll probably talk a little bit about that, but... You know what? I'm gonna let Kyle introduce himself and tell you a little bit about him. Kyle, tell the people who you are, man, where you're from, and talk about you, bro. Thanks, Chad. I appreciate it. I'm Kyle from uh, Rochester, New York. Well, Webster, I'm right outside of Rochester, and uh, you know, basically, uh, my story it's a uh, lot, lot to do with addiction. Being from the suburbs, I wasn't prepared for all that, but it hit me the way it did anyway. I got a great family, um, always there supporting me, but. Something didn't click up here. Something wasn't right up here. And I just went off the rails with addiction. And uh, that landed me in prison, county jail, a ton of trouble in and out of school, a ton, ton of trouble in and out of college, a ton of trouble in wherever I went because I just couldn't put it down, drugs and or alcohol. And uh, that landed me in that. And finally, you know, got out of it by the grace of God, found some recovery and today, hoping to give back to people and help share the story and, uh, you know, just uh, plant the seed in other people's heads so they can avoid the same path that I went down. I definitely appreciate you coming on the show. I want to talk yeah. a little bit about, you know, how you grew up. You grew up in a good neighborhood. You you went to yeah. a really good school. How old were you when you started using drugs, man? Uh, first time I drank was 13. First time I used anything else was 14. It went from alcohol and then weed was next and then cocaine. To me, it was like, you know, I've shared this before. There was a seed planted and they say roughly 15% of the population is predisposed to addiction. That's all being researched and go back and forth. If that's the case, I definitely believe I'm one of them because that first time I drank was like, boom, this seed was planted. Whole, you know, I get it. If alcohol can do this, what can Coke do? What can we do? What can ecstasy do? So then, you know, fast forward a year later, two years later, whatever, whenever that new drug was put in front of me, it was like game time. I'm willing to try it because this other drug calmed my anxiety and nerves and all this stuff, which was all self-imposed. My family never put pressure on me to do anything. Great parents at every parent teacher conference at every softball, football, basketball game, whatever. And it was just this stuff going on up here. And as soon as I had the chance to, to take it, I ran with it. But I always kind of kept it in check with outside stuff in the beginning stages. Did very well in football, did very well in school, and also learned if I do well doing those things, I can kind of manipulate my way and to keep getting high. And people, they'd always like, give me a chance. Or, or you know, they'd always, uh, well, Kyle got in a little trouble, but it's okay. He's doing well at other stuff. So it was just, uh, I kind of bought my way out of it almost, so to speak. Let me ask you this, right? Because I know there's yeah. issues, man. Even in that school right now, I know there's some issues. Yeah. How many of your friends were using drugs at that time? Was it a lot? Was it a small percentage? How many people? In the beginning, it wasn't a lot. But the thing was, as soon as I started doing it, I gravitated to the people that were doing it. So it became out of, you know, the five or six guys I hung out with, they drank a little bit and maybe one or two smoked weed. But then it was soon as I started getting into Coke a little bit more and then, you know, all the other things, it was like, all right, then I found the guys who did that and gravitated to them. So then out of my core group of seven or eight friends, six of them were doing the same thing I was doing because we all like found each other, the same ones that were doing everything, you know? Do you think, you know, when you're in high school, man, and you're using drugs, what is it? What do you think the reason is that kids end up doing that stuff? Like when I was in high school, man, I played football, I played sports, yeah. you know, there was like a couple kids in school that like used drugs and I was like, stay away from them cats. But what, what drove you to that, man? Was it depression at home? Was it, you just wanted to be cool? You just wanted to get high? What was it? That's the ultimate question, Chad. I, and I did the same thing. Like I, I played ball all the way through college. I played football in college. So like I had outside things going very well for me. And those guys that I just mentioned, I was, I was partying with. We're all playing football, doing decent in school too, but it was like definitely depression and, and definitely a, I think an abnormal level of anxiety that I don't know if I was born with or what going on up here where it just like, I felt like everybody got 
the plan to life except me. You know, sitting in fourth, uh, fifth grade, seventh grade, any of those, you know, just it was like I felt like everyone had a little step up that I missed. I missed the morning meeting. I missed something on how to like enjoy and be present and kind of go. But I get it now. Everyone's got their level of anxiety. Everyone's got their struggles. Maybe my brain has a little bit more. And it was like, as soon as anything came into play, that first thing I happened to find being alcohol that quieted it down, I ran with it, just completely ran with it. And uh, it wasn't like totally off the rails right in the beginning, because those things like like football and school kept it a little bit in check. But not only did I decide to run with it, I surrounded myself with others who clearly had similar problems and they ran with it too. And we just took it to an extreme. Were there kids in school that you were cool with that once you started using drugs, they were like, man, we're staying away from Kyle, man. Not so much in high school because uh, I kept it very low key. And uh, because I did so well in football and other things, it was, I was still pretty popular. An older brother, two, two years older than me was very popular too. So I always had a ton of friends around, but um, college that absolutely happened. People were like, you know, what the hell is he doing? That's when I started getting more into oxys and heroin and hanging out with people that were, you know, you could just clearly tell these people were not doing the right thing. And uh, that's exactly where friends and friends were like, what, the, you know, what are you doing, bro? What, what is going on? And at that point, it was just I was too far gone to, to listen to anybody. So let me ask you this. Even in high school, I mean, some kids knew you were using drugs, right? Yeah, absolutely. There was a, it, it was a, a quieter thing, though. It was, um, I'm sure there was times and part of people that were like avoided a party me and my buddies went to because they knew we'd probably have, you know, a couple grams of Coke on us, at least, you know, partying. But it, it didn't necessarily trickle its way back around to me. I didn't hear about it much. So I guess that's, you know, if they did avoid me, I'm sure they, whatever, they kept it to themselves. So. Were you ever embarrassed? Were you ever like, damn, man, I don't want them to know, man, I'm using drugs in college or high school? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in high school, it was more um, getting in trouble was when I was embarrassed. I got a DWI at 16 and it was like, all right, everybody knew that, you know, I can't even I'm, I'm already drinking excessive amounts. I was embarrassed. And then there were there was some rumors that got back to the football coaches about a couple parties we had. There was a lot of coke being done. And it was definitely embarrassing because it was like you'd see a couple people giving different looks like, what are you doing? And and in my case, it was like, you're going to throw away your, your scholarship. You're going to throw away football, this and that. What are you doing? So there's definitely embarrassment. And college, that got brought to a whole new level. I mean, I was bringing around, hey, you know, I, I don't like to put the word on it, but just complete total fiends like and with myself to my college house with my buddies who are playing football. I mean, I'm bringing people that are just completely sick, you know, full blown addiction over hanging out. And these, they stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, but the embarrassment went away shortly thereafter because it was like, I needed these people and the substances more at that time than anything else. It had a total control of me. Let me ask you about your parents. Did this, you know, did yeah. the addiction crush your parents? Were there times when your mom just broke down crying like, Kyle, please get your life together? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. They tried. They did probably what you'd see in, in, in any movie, any any story. They tried everything from the punishment, the tough discipline to the the disappointment, to the, the tough talks, the crying impatient outpatient uh they tried anything and everything they could and it got to a point you know with uh fast past college after when i got out where i'm living with them but i'm robbing everything they have i was destroying their life in every way possible and they just they had enough they kicked me out of the house they started doing treatment themselves so to speak like a little bit of alanon things like that to learn how to cope with their own lives and just realized if they let me stay there, I would absolutely destroy everything and kicked me out of the house. But there was a ton of crying nights, a ton of just uh, disappointment. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of other words to describe it. It, it. Every word that somebody can imagine fit right into the picture. 
So your parents are crying, your mother's crying. Is there ever a time when you go look in the mirror, Kyle, and you're like, this has to stop? Oh, yeah. Multiple times. I, I would say, oh, towards the end, the last couple of years, almost a night, that was almost a nightly thing. But the problem then becomes the physical addiction is so strong. I can sit there at night high and I can't do this anymore. What is going on? You got to stop. You're destroying everybody. Then wake up in the morning, the dope sick kicks in complete. The only thing that's going to fix that is either get through five to seven days of pure pain and misery or use again. And it's like that pull to use becomes so strong. You know, they've done articles on it where it hits the same part of the brain as a survival for food, for water, for sex. So it's like that pull just takes over and then the cycle starts the next day. And that just this constant thing that you almost, and then you get so depressed that you can't stop before your friends and your family and what you're doing to them, that the only thing you know how to relieve some of that pain is again, use, and it becomes this miserable, endless cycle. And you're from the suburbs, yeah. right? So people that don't yeah. know, like you're from a, a place where when I was a kid, I used to think, man, that's where all the rich people lived at, you know, <laughs> Webster. Those, those are the yeah. good people. So you're living in Webster. This is where you're growing up yeah. at. But eventually, man, you got to venture off into the city, right? My part yep. of the town. Um, to get drugs, man. Well, how, how old were you the first time you had to go to the city to go get drugs? Well, it first started with, with either somebody, I knew somebody that got was willing to go so they would go i'd give them money and they would go so i didn't physically have to go and then it becomes this where the part of your brain's like all right i know they're obviously making a piece off me they're 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 middling it so they're taking some of my money so let me venture myself that first time would have been 15 and it was just for weed but it broke the barrier a little bit. My father's also, my father grew up in the city here in Rochester. He's brought us to, we have family in the city. So there's been times where he kind of taught us a little bit about certain areas, things to do, and just brought us up in a general, he, you know, he was born in Italy. He's an Italian immigrant, but grew up in some tough areas uh, around New York City and then here in Rochester. So he brought us up to have a little bit of smarts to know what to do, what not to do. And that fear got overtaken by the pull for drugs, became giving somebody money, then just started going myself. And as soon as I realized kind of how easy it was, like somebody's willing to run out to my car, take care of it. And don't get me wrong. There was a couple of times in there where I got robbed. I got pulled over. People just take the money, never come back to the car. A lot of lessons learned, but it became all right, screw this. I need the money. I need the drugs more than the other people. So I'm going to just take that risk, that ride myself. A lot of fear, absolutely scared. But uh, after doing it seven, eight, nine times, it becomes almost a uh, routine. You know, it, it was, I, I think I've started to realize most people didn't want, they wanted the money. They didn't want to necessarily rob me. Uh, because uh, not that I had anything to rob at that point in time, we're spending 40, 50, $30, but they wanted the money and they wanted the clientele. So they're willing to kind of take care of us. Let's talk a little bit about the city, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a very dangerous city. It was on Fox news yeah. two weeks ago where we have the highest murder rate in the country per person, worse yeah. than Chicago, worse than Washington, DC. You're going over by what Bay over by Bay to cop You're you know, the East side, definitely, dangerous dangerous places over there you know i had a kid that i knew named k fuji ended up with like 88 years they had a white kid Jeez. from the suburbs come over there he tried to buy some weed and they shot him in the head and robbed him for like 12 dollars. so you were definitely taking a chance with your life and there's other young people yeah. that are watching this show you know females males boys girls men women that are venturing in these areas where you know hey your drug addiction is putting your life in jeopardy kind of right yep Absolutely. And it's uh, that becomes that back and forth battle that was definitely sitting in part of my brain. Uh, just a couple, you know, I'd always go to like Bay Street for the people watching their in or around Rochester that know, you know, Bay Street was the area I'd always go for, for crack. That was somehow seemed to be the crack spot. And then the Clinton corridor was always for the dope. Uh, then it became I'd always go to Clinton for dope and, and coke at the end. But um it, it was that back and forth in the head of like, yes, you are taking this risk. I, I knew a kid 
uh, he went, there was a certain crack house off of, um, it was off Hudson that we, I used to go to consistently. And I'd go in there and smoke. Another white kid from Victor, kid from the suburbs, went there one time. And they beat this kid into a coma just a week before I went there. Um, and uh, the guy that I went with was telling me all about it. And then I ended up seeing two people on the news get arrested for it. So I'm sitting in this house smoking, thinking like, you're out of your mind sitting here doing this. But again, it was like, I need the drugs. I'm going to do it, but I'll just try to find a different way to do it. Or I'll be different than this kid. I'll be quieter. I'll be safer. Or I'll get my shit and get out of there and not sit there and smoke like he did. So it was always this back and forth, good angel, bad angel battle. You don't want to do it, but shit, I need to do it. So I don't have a choice right now. You also talked about, before we came on, we talked like for two minutes, literally, yeah. right? You had told me a little something about, you know, someone was robbing one of the dope houses you went to and tell the people what happened when, when they're robbing this dope house and how yeah. far your addiction had you. That's exact. I was going to say, this is the perfect story to explain how nuts the pull for drugs is I go, I pull up to this house. I went to all the time. It was uh, off of Clinton off of Orchard street and um, pull up. And so this guy, I know another guy who got high is standing outside and he's in front of this tree. And you could tell he's using the tree as like a shield almost not that anyone's actively shooting at him, but he's like kind of hiding behind it. And I'm like, yo, I know um, I go, I slap him up, go to walk past him to go in the house. And he grabs me and he's like, yo, I wouldn't go in there right now. I'm like, why? He's like, I was just in there about the cop and two dudes busted in with masks on. And, you know, they literally kicked me down the porch and said, get the, you know, get the hell out of here. So I'm sitting there and there's like this three, three to five second decision. I'm, I'm late. I had to go to work. I'm dope sick. I'm freaking out. I just something in my brain pushed and I just went right in the house. I walk in the house and just dude turns and he's got the gun pointing right at me. They got the people in the house on the floor and they're bagging up, you know, putting everything from the table. They're putting it in their own bag. And I just came out with it. I'm like, listen, I ain't trying to bother anybody. I'm sick as hell. I don't care if it's you guys or you guys. Can somebody sell me a bag? And the dude came up to me and was like, are you out of your mind? And he just was right up in my face. He just lost it on me. I again said that I threw $20 on the floor. He took two bags, threw it at me, and then literally kicked me in the ass as I was walking out the door. I end up literally still getting two bags. But that was, I mean, like how they didn't shoot me, pistol whip me or beat me for any reason. I, I have no idea. And as I'm walking out, I'm thinking that was one of the stupidest things you've ever done in your life for two little bags when there's a dozen other places you can go to around the corner. But that was, it, it's almost like um, being in a cloud during that time between the dope sickness and the, just the whole addiction, rational thoughts aren't there. They just, they, they're not now, even now, if like crossing the street, you stop, you look, you know, it's just that doesn't seem to work right for people in active addiction. And it's actually scientifically proven it destroys the frontal lobe, which is like our stop sign, our thinking area. So those things that would normally come in and say, are you nuts? This kid just told you somebody's in there robbing somebody else. Like on top of the other consequences of you go in there, you could be implicated. They could think you're involved. There's just a ton of reasons not to do that. But yeah, I walked right up in there. Definitely a, definitely a crazy, <laughs> crazy choice. You know, my, uh, yeah. my father struggled with addiction. You know, I never really knew my dad until I got older. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know the things that, you know, people go through. Definitely not easy. Definitely a struggle. So how are you paying for your drug addiction? You start robbing houses, burglarizing. What are you doing? Yep, exactly. I started doing that. And then I started doing what we talked about a minute ago. The other kids from Webster that were still scared to go to the city, I'd be that middle for them too. So, you know, make quick $20, $30 off of each trip or each person that was out here that didn't want to go to the city also start robbing houses. And then, you know, I cleaned out, I, I found any and every way to get money. I always worked. That was one thing I always, I always had a job. Um, so, you know, typically restaurants or manual labor, type landscaping, window cleaning, I, all those. So I always had some type of paycheck coming in, uh, but anything and everything that was, a you know, like I remember just for a small example, but like I had college textbooks left over. 
boom, sell them and pawn them. Then when I'm when I'm doing that, I happen to look at some old college loan stuff. Even though I'm two years past out of college, I'm still considered a student because I'm still on there. And I end up taking out a student loan, getting $2,000 cash, spending it all on that. Little things like that, that just anything and everything that you could possibly scam or steal or imagine I would do. Stole every TV in my parents' house. Just terrible stuff. Um, destroyed everyone around me. Pawn every, you know, grandparents gave us a gift, gold necklace, you know, pawn that, whatever was available, it's gone. And, and then got to the point where no one would let me around. So then I started committing burglaries, robbing houses. That was when, that was when things really kind of, kind of took off for me starting to commit all the burglaries. Cause it was, you're, you're stepping your game up now. You're, you're level, you're getting, before if I got caught, it would be, a lot of time, you know, I had getting pulled over before with a bag of dope and I've gotten lucky sometimes city cops literally say, get the hell out of here. If it was a bag, never got caught more than one bag because then they would charge, at least I think, I don't know what they would do. But um, you now it's like you're, you're committing felonies daily. So, you know, shit could hit the fan very soon, but that wasn't really in my mindset. It was, uh, you know, it was just the drugs, the drugs and the money came first. Eventually, you end up going to state prison, but we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, yeah. what led to that. You get arrested, you go to the county jail. What's it like for you to go to the county jail, man? That was a complete shock for me. And the first two, three weeks were a total daze because, you, you know, this is the first time in about a decade where I am totally, totally without drugs and alcohol. So my body went through a, a absolute shock uh, that first couple of weeks. They kept me down and um, uh, they kept me down in the medical unit for the first you know week, just threw me in a cell and basically got a detox, you know, detox out of it. And I went through that. Then they brought me up to people that know Rochester area, the towers in our county jail, three north. And I spent the next two weeks just sleeping. So I wasn't really around. I, I would come down for one tray a day or else they, you know, they told me you have to eat something. And that's it. But then when I finally got up, I'd say two and a half to three weeks after getting arrested, it was a total just complete shock. I still had hope that somebody would come bail me out, uh, but they gave me a ridiculously high bail because I got I had charges in four or five different suburbs of Rochester. Um, so I'm sitting there assuming someone's going to bail me out. I'm not fully understanding the weight of the charges yet. And as each day went by, nobody's coming to bail me out. The charges are stacking up. It finally was like, all right, you're screwed. You better get comfortable here. You better get used to this because you're screwed. And I'd say that started to happen five, six weeks um, after being arrested. I didn't get in, you know, I was pretty quiet. I'm, a, I'm naturally when I'm in an environment, I don't know. I'm very quiet. So I didn't, you know get in much trouble with any of the, any of the guys in the, in, in the unit, because it was just, I sat to myself, found a couple of guys who played cards, a couple older Italian guys who played cards, just sat with them, played cards. So I didn't even meet some people that I was with till two, three months into it. Our County jail is definitely a dangerous place. Like if you end up on the mainframe, the towers are kind of more, you know, for the people Late, who aren't like, yeah. you know, in there for murder and, and, you know, violent crimes and stuff like that. But do things happen over there? Like, are they people stealing people's stuff? What's going on over there in the towers? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there definitely was. Uh, I was in with a couple of guys who had murder charges. For whatever reason, they weren't on the, the frame. I, I don't know. But um, there was definitely a, a different uh, wide group of people. There was a lot of fights. Um, just, I don't know, not daily, definitely not daily, but at least uh, two, three times a week, their fights usually over, you know, a lot of what the jail fights are. Somebody owes somebody debt. This dude came in from this neighborhood or this dude was snitching on this person. And that was one thing I learned uh, very early on, too, is they wanted me to they asked me, if you give up the houses you bought dope at, you know, we'll give you a, a less time. We'll give you a two and two, which my and my ended up sentence ended to be three and a half. But um, and I said, no. And um, that was one of the best things I ever did. And I'm so glad I did. First of all, it just was against what I kind of thought of as being an upstanding person. You just don't do that shit. But second of all, I seen dudes get their ass beat who were snitching. And it was like, 
I never had to look over my shoulder for that reason because there was definitely those type of fights in there too. Somebody would disappear for six to eight hours during the day, come back, all of a sudden other guys are getting pulled out of the unit for this, that, whatever. And when they come back, they just beat the hell out of that dude. And it was, I didn't have to worry about that. I just kind of stayed low key and stayed out of that stuff, played some cards, but definitely a lot of, a lot of little fights going on. Um, I didn't see anyone get stabbed in there, but I did see somebody get raped pretty bad in the towers. That was, uh, uh, there was a guy who, he was in Attica and a couple other places for about 20 years. Uh, he had, um, I don't know what his exact charge was. I know at least one of them was a murder charge. So this is 20 years later, there's new evidence in his case. They bring him back to the county to uh, fight his new case. He, he got, you would know all the legal terms. He got approved for a new trial or whatever. So they bring him back to the county. And I, I mean, I guess he was just so institutionalized. He ends up taking this young boy and kind of grooming him for a couple months. And then one day brings him up to his cell and just brutally rapes him. And we're sitting there, I mean, about... 20 feet away hearing everything were wide the, you know, the little windows they have in the cell, we could see movement going on we could see arms flailing and the little kid comes out and he's bleeding. And it was just this disaster. The little kid ends up going down to medical and, you know, telling them everything they come and jack the other guy out, rip him out. From what I heard, he ended up winning his murder case. So he got released or was supposed to get released and get some big settlement for 20 years of wrongful, um, you know, incarceration, but now was charged with rape and ended up getting an additional 15 and having to go up and do that. So it was one of the wildest stories. If you put it from start to finish, everything that happened that, that I ever could, you couldn't even make that up how, how it all played out. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a ton of info to kind of grab. That's that's definitely uh, wasn't expecting that story there, Kyle. But <laughs> definitely not. Uh, d definitely don't want stuff like that to happen. No, no one went up there to intervene. Like, yo, what's up? That was an interesting part too. That was something I learned. So the guy that did it just the week before, me and the guy, the guy that that did the rape, me and him didn't get along. He, um, I don't know, he didn't like me from the start. I was a, a, a trustee at, at that point in time. So I'm handing out trays. He got into it with me one day because they didn't have his gluten tray or whatever, um, gluten free, whatever. So I almost and I'm new and I was pissed at him and I got my I'm a bigger dude. I'm I'm 250. I'm six foot. I, I got my balls up one day and I was going to go up in there and just go at him one on one in a cell. Win, lose or draw. Let's go. And my buddy grabbed me. And my buddy, um, he, you know, he knew him, this other guy who spoke Spanish, they spoke back and forth, the guy who committed the, the rape, he knew him pretty well. He's like, grab me, do not go up in his cell. And I'm like, why? He's like, he's got a banger in there about that big. I don't know how he got it, but he's got it in there. You go in there, you ain't coming out. And that was one of the reasons some people didn't intervene. And also some of the old timers grabbed a couple of the younger people and were like, leave people alone, let them do their own damn thing in here. I was too, I was new enough to just kind of sit back and no one else was going to do anything. I wasn't going to be the only one. So I don't know. That was a lesson. I kind of, it's something I regret, but it, you know, staying out of people's business was kind of how I survived. Let me in say there. this, you know, yeah, you're supposed to stay out of people's business, but when shit like that's happening, yeah, I don't know, man, you know, in federal prison, if you know, white dudes raping a white dude, we're definitely getting involved, homie, going up there it was, and smashing that dude. And, He's not yeah. going to be around um, ever again. But, um, you know, I understand mind your own business. But when shit like that's happening, bro, I don't care, man. I'm intervening, bro. Even if it's a, yeah. you know, it don't even matter what color. Some older dude's raping some young kid, man. I don't, I'm not standing around. But, you know, you're not, you weren't, you weren't a seasoned uh, convict or criminal at, at the time. Or you were probably five jail. months in, yeah. So you end up going to state prison, right? You get, you yeah. know, what, what do you get? Three and a third to seven or three and a half to seven? I got three and a half flat. Get the three and a half flat. You go to state prison. Yeah. Where do you go to reception at? Uh, Elmira. Went to reception Elmira. That was uh, interesting. Pulling up there, definitely a lot of fear walking in that place. You know, just seeing the reception unit of four or five tiers high, 
50 cells per per tier walking in that football size football stadium size unit was just like whoa and i'm seeing you know they a couple dudes lit their toilet paper on fire and threw it down and a couple guys in front of me was uh was a rapo so they're tossing soap at him and and you know just screaming obscenities and throwing stuff so it was just like uh definitely a shock walking in there uh, the good thing was there was at least eight or nine dudes from county that I had met that were there. So I had a couple people to shoot the shit with and spin the yard and kind of show me what was going on. Uh, but that was definitely a shock. People don't realize, man, you're walking into these, you know, some of the oldest prisons in the country. You're in Elmira, you're walking in, there's all kinds of noise. There's what, four ranges up each side. People are throwing yep. shit. People are screaming. Like you yep. said, the cops will definitely tell people like, yo, that dude over there, he's a chomo. That dude over there, he's a yep. rapo. And dudes do. I mean, it, it's not even racial. Well, when I was there, it wasn't really racially segregated. It was more, where are you from segregated? Like, Rochester dudes would be with Rochester dudes. Buffalo dudes with Buffalo dudes. New York City dudes yep. with them. But definitely, if it was a dude that was a SO, man, I mean, they're hitting him with soap, hitting him with spoiled milks. Yep. Those dudes don't come out of their cell. Sometimes they, like, get their tray brought to their cell. So dudes will be walking to child and get a spoiled milk and wham, right yep. into their cell. Those are the things you're seeing happen over there? Oh, yeah. All of that. It, I, I was surprised. It's just like you said a minute ago. I was shocked at the difference of county and in prison, the guards, because the guards in prison didn't take no shit. It was, you know, they'll, they'll beat the hell out of you with that nightstick in a second. And they also like they just like you said, dude over there, you know, Chomo right there. And I was like, oh shit, okay, that's how that's how it goes out goes down here. And uh, the other thing I was gonna say, you mentioned a minute ago, people stick together. I was shocked at how much Rochester watched each other's back, which was awesome. Uh, dudes from Rochester, every spot I went had a little, uh, uh, just a kind of an unknown rule, stronger than Buffalo, than New York City, than the Bronx, than anywhere else. Dudes from Rochester watched each other's back and helped you. As long as you didn't have no, no messed up charges, you weren't showing them any of that, they got you. So everywhere I went, as soon as it was from Rochester, it was like, all right, somebody, you know, a couple people uh, open it up, helping you out a little bit, get you started a little bit um, and with nothing in return, no bullshit being asked back. So now let's talk about this. You Eventually you get your life together, right? You sober mm -hmm. up. You know, how do you get off drugs, man? Tell the people. For me, it was, uh, you know, um, I did a lot of solid, I, I did a, over a year in solitary, uh, all for drug use that really, really hurt. Uh, I was not, I was one of those people that solitary crushed, um, just with all the depression and mental health, that was a lot of pain. I never wanted to go back through. And then when I got out, I got in some more trouble and went back to Willard, which for those that don't know, is like a boot camp in New York state for parolees. They brought in people from AA uh, to speak and something about this guy came in. It was the first time I connected with somebody who was like, he got his life together. He's a former inmate, former convict, did all this stuff himself. It was the first time I related and really thought there is a different way to get, you know, to, to do life, to try this and let me give this a try. And for me, that was 12 step programs and uh, AA has helped save my life, AA, NA, all the 12 step stuff. Uh, that was really the first time there was a glimmer of hope. And I just ran with that full steam ahead. And don't get me wrong. There was a lot of outpatient, you know, some of it state mandated from parole and therapy state mandated and stuff like that, that all helped too. But, uh, you know, that was the core of it, was the 12-step program. You know, I had my boy on the other day, man, Cam, I was in prison with, and, man. you know, he's struggling with addiction. He's like, dude, I just like getting high. I think there comes a point where something has to click, and you have to say, you know what? I don't want to live like this, man. Is that yep. kind of what happened in your mind? Like, yo, I'm done. I've had enough? Yeah, absolutely. It was when I was back in, when I got rearrested, I was back in the county jail. I had a phone call to my parents. It was just a devastating call. They just, they're like, we're, we're planning your brother's wedding and we're planning your funeral. And they were, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't exaggeration. I'd overdosed multiple times. It was just like, they, they, they had enough, something about being back in there. I just, I was that total rock bottom scene that they describe emotional, physical, mental, where I had had enough to where the pain of staying the same, um, you know, 
outweighed the pain of trying to change. And I was willing to try to change at this point in time. So, you know, you got your life together. I know you got a YouTube channel. It's called Sober Dogs, right? Yep. Yeah. I, I, when I was, you know, when I first got out, I kind of, uh, I hid from it a little bit. I'd see people out at Wagman's out at the store. How you doing? And like, if I tell them the truth, I'd be like, Oh, you know, I'm i uh, I'm a week out of prison. I live with my parents. I don't got a job. I'm losing my mind. I'm craving drugs and I'm freaking out, but I didn't want to lie to them. And it was just like, you know what, put your story out there. Maybe you could help other people. I knew from an internal point of view, it would help myself cope with it. And I uh, just started sharing and started with a blog and then moved to YouTube. And now I just share about everything, addiction, recovery related and everything in between some stuff about prison. And I try to get into the nitty gritty too of like, what is somebody thinking during, you know, like that, that walking in the house uh, when they're being robbed? Like I did a video on that of like, what is our somebody literally going through their brain at that point in time to help people get a better understanding of how insane addiction is? Well, definitely you're doing yeah. some good things, man. How long have you been sober? Uh, so I got three and a half years right now. And uh, prior to that, I had a five day relapse with uh, over, a, over a year sober. So Basically, I got a little bit over four years with five days of use in between there. You got to stay strong. You got to keep pushing, man. You don't want to disappoint yeah. yourself. Don't want to disappoint your parents, man. And, you know, it's up to you, man. I mean, you're on the right yeah. path right now. You're in the driver's seat, bro. And there's people watching the show that are addicted to drugs. There's people that are someone's dope sick right now, but they still got their phone. They might be watching this, right? And, yeah. you know, really the message is, man, it's got to click upstairs. You got to want it, man. It's not easy. Yeah. It's like climbing a mountain and sometimes you're going to fall, but you got to get up, dust yourself off and keep pushing, right? Yep. 100%. And I'd say to anybody out there struggling, give yourself a chance. Like that was one thing I never was able to do is give myself some credit, some slack because of all that negative stuff we, you know, I did. It was like, you're a piece of junk. You're this or that, that, uh, give yourself a chance and just try and just take it one step at a time and you can rebuild your life. Don't overwhelm yourself. Just take it one step at a time. But yeah, you said it perfectly. And I know you're doing some other stuff too, man. Cause I know you are working with rock recovery. I used to work out there a few times when I first got out, you, uh, you're going into schools, talking to people. I think you were in the Wisconsin department of corrections, talking to people, right? Yep. Yeah. It was, uh, I volunteer at rock recovery and uh, we get to go into schools and talk to kids, everything from 12th grade down to seventh, eighth grade, uh, all that. And uh, also I've had the awesome ability to certain um, department of corrections, Wisconsin specifically reached out. They're basically trying to figure out we're losing all these parolees. They're dying from overdose. What type of things helped? What type of things didn't help when you were on parole? What type of, uh, programs worked and you know i get to speak with them and talk to parole officers about you know what to do and help save people's lives and also kind of get it in their head too of like the goal is rehabilitation and not just to send people back to prison i got high in prison all the time that's not the best spot for somebody using but it's like depending on what they did you know plant the seed in, in these parole officers head of getting them help is the best i you know the best thing here so well, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your experiences. You know, addiction is serious, man. It's something that I like yep. to talk about, too. And uh, I'm hope I'm hopeful that your story will kind of motivate people. I'm going to tell people, man, to check out, you know, your YouTube channel. We'll put the link in there. I finally learned how to do it the right way. So um, everybody check out that link. Check out Sober Dogs. Kyle's a good dude, man. He's on the right path. He's doing good things. And, you know, I'm just happy. I'm happy for you, bro. I'm happy for your mom. I seen your mom Thank drive you. by me yesterday. I'm like, she's like, hey, I'm Kyle's mom. I'm like, well. Tell Kyle to call me because I lost your number. So, yeah, you know, definitely, I definitely appreciate you, man, and wish you all the best, brother. Thank you for coming on. I'm going to close the show. I'm going to tell people, man, check them out, Sober Dogs. With respect, until tomorrow, Blood on the Razor Wire TV, we're out. <laughs>